Hey, it's the Adam Ragusea podcast. In this ep, we're going to talk about a new study on xanthan gum and how it is metabolized in the human gut. And we're going to talk about an incidence of musical plagiarism that starts with a dose of Coke syrup. It's a long story. But first, you may have heard his awesomely screechy voice discussing matters of fitness and diet with a level of frankness unusual for a Canadian such as himself. A grown-ass man in his late 40s, he is an unlikely prince among bodybuilding YouTubers. He has more subs than almost anyone else in that category. And he cooks. He's the author of The Ultimate Anabolic Cookbook. He is the one and only Greg Doucette. Well, everyone seems to call me Coach Greg it's just because I used to coach people and I, I've been a professional bodybuilder, powerlifter, school teacher, master's degree in, in um, uh, kinesiology. And more recently, I started making uh, cooking recipes and cooking videos, selling cookbooks to help people lose weight. And I know you're an actual chef. I'm like a nobody chef. Like, I don't know how to cook. And so I think that's the beauty of what I do is that I don't know how to cook. And so if I can make it, you can make it. If I make a video and I can do it, and then you know how to do it. I watch some of your videos. I watch you make ice cream and I'm like, I can't do it. It's like three hours and you have to mix forever, put it in a frizz, take it out in two different bowls and ice and salt. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's so much work. So my recipes are just very healthy and simple and it doesn't take a lot of skill as opposed to your, your, your recipes, a lot more skill involved. You actually know what you're doing. I'm just some guy that just throws stuff together and got lucky. Well, d does, it, does a guy as strong and lean as you ever eat ice cream anyway? I eat protein ice cream almost every day, anabolic ice cream. Most people watch my channel see that I've lifted the, the ice cream over the head test. I mix it up in a blender. The quickest thing, you just put in some ice, some protein powder, Greek yogurt, frozen strawberries, and what have you, a bit of sugar twin or Splenda, whatever you want, a little bit of milk, water, blend it up, some guar gum to make it thicker. And it's super thick, awesome, low in calories, high in protein. And so I don't really eat ice cream anymore. I use uh, Greek yogurt ice cream bars. I just have no control. Once that ice cream starts, it's like the whole two liters gone. I'm one of those. It's one of my uh, trigger foods. I can't stop eating it. So I try to keep foods that are healthy in the house. I, I think that people um, who have some awareness of bodybuilding know you guys eat plain chicken and rice, plain chicken and rice, plain chicken and rice, six, seven meals a day. And people understand why you need to eat a very strict diet. But I think maybe what they don't understand is why you wouldn't try to at least make it taste decent. Like why did the, I mean, cause you can put seasoning on like plain chicken and rice, but like so many of these guys don't, it just looks like misery. Why do you do that? I honestly think that bodybuilders, they love to suffer. They want to brag that they suffer more than other people and say, I was a bodybuilder. I, I grew up. I said, well, I didn't know anything. I'm a kid. I'm doing my first show. I'm in grade 12. I'm looking, what am I supposed to eat? Chicken. And you forgot this, the broccoli and rice. It's always chicken, broccoli, and rice eight times a day. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm doing it and I'm hating life. I don't like this. I'm a guy that likes donuts and candies and ice cream. I was a kid. I ate all kinds of junk food. I did triathlon. So I luckily burn off all those calories so I could get away with it. But then you're getting older and you're like, it's not worth it. So I started experimenting. I started saying, well, why am I not eating this French toast? Why am I not eating a lower ca calorie lasagna, lower calorie pizza? And I started doing that. And then I started coaching people, giving them these recipes and saying, this is how I eat. This is how you can eat. And they started winning. They were showing up shredded, ripped, lean, and not gaining as much weight in the off season. And so other people saw that and they're like, wait a minute, this coach, chicken, broccoli, and rice eight times a day, this guy, French toast and all kinds of popcorn and peanut butter and jam. I'm going with that coach. That's interesting. So in your experience, um, helping people with their diets for a competition or whatever, your, your experience tells you that if you take, if you work to make the healthy food actually taste good, that actually um, improves what they'd call in adherence to the diet, right? So like people are actually are less likely to cheat because that's contrary to what I've heard other guys say. I've heard other guys say that like, oh, I got to eat the boring food because if I eat exciting food, then it just sends me down a very dangerous path where I'll seek all kinds of pleasures that are going to mess with my goals. That's a great point. And what happens in the short term, that boring food can in fact work short term. But if you want to lose the weight and keep it off, you need to not just like your food, love your food. Anyone can crash diet month, two months, whatever, lose the 10, 20 pounds, but then can you keep it off? And if you're going without the foods that you love, your willpower is soon going to run out and you're going to have an, enough of it and you're going to go off that diet. 
You can get your protein from so many sources. Why keep it to being something boring? What? I've seen bodybuilders that seem to eat no vegetables. Why, why do they do that? They do it because they don't like it because vegetables inherently don't taste as good as other foods. So they don't want to eat it, but they should. It doesn't mean that they're getting away with like not doing it. They, they have a healthier diet if they did that. And most North Americans eat about 40% of the fiber recommendations, somewhere around 15 grams. A male should be around 35, females 25. Most people are not getting enough fiber, not getting enough vegetables. That vegetables, they're very low in calories, low calorie dense foods. They allow you to be more full, more satiated. And the number one reason diets fail is hunger. If you're hungry, you're eventually going to eat. You don't have the willpower, hunger pains going on. And so add those fruits, add those vegetables to that chicken, uh, whatever meal you're eating, and then allow yourself to be more full. And you will in fact stick to your diet. I mean, given, given that dudes that look like you are, are eating, you know, like so much food, you know, six, six, seven meals a day. And if you're not eating vegetables, forgive me for putting it crudely, but how do you poop? Like there's no fiber in that diet, aren't the? I mean, and it's, and it's a giant diet with tons of food and no fiber. How are these guys not all backed up? I think the guys that are eating the five thousand plus calories by by luck or by chance, even though they're not eating enough, for example, vegetables and fruits, they're eating so much volume of food food that they're going to by chance get that fiber. They're eating a lot of people are eating oatmeal. They're going to eat a balance of stuff. So you get one gram of fiber here, two grams there, and you eat it eight times in a day. It's slowly going to add up. But for most people on a normal calorie intake, eighteen hundred calories a day for women, twenty eight hundred for men. That's about average. And the average person's overweight, so it's probably too much for most people. These people are going to struggle to get in the amount of fiber they need because they're choosing from a far, far fewer calorie range. What are your thoughts on salt? Lots of bodybuilders do no added salt in their food. Salt is something that I eat as much of as I absolutely want. I have no problem with consuming a lot of salt. In fact, salt can help you get a bigger pump. You shouldn't have to worry about it unless this caveat, unless you suffer from some kind of heart condition where the doctors told you, hey, you have to have less salt in your diet because of your blood pressure and so on. But for most people, you can have as much salt as you want. I probably consume 10 grams plus a day, 10,000 milligrams a day. I sweat a lot. It's in a lot of my foods that I eat. I eat a lot of canned foods as well. And so sodium for me is not a concern. I suppose the blood pressure concern for people who are salt sensitive, hypertensive, that probably is a particularly big issue for some for bodybuilders who are on antibiotic steroids who, who have high blood pressure generally anyway, right? Well, if you're, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're on steroids, for example, obviously you're going to have higher blood pressure than the average person just as on average. And so if the doctor's saying, you know, you have hypertension issues, you have to be more careful, but for the most part, it's not usually the salt that's doing this. It's more so like the drugs or the increased body fat or being too heavy or the lack of cardiovascular exercise, not eating a proper balanced diet that is more important than the, the salt. And people think they're fat because of salt. Salt doesn't have calories. It just retains water, but it's it's hard to retain water without glycogen and glycogen is formed from carbohydrates, Th uh, three grams of water for every one gram of carb formed in the muscle. So people that eat a lot of rice or pastas and so on, they're usually going to hold a lot more water. Add to that salt, you can get bloated. And on to the opposite extent, people who follow keto diets that are really, really low in carbs, they sometimes lose 10 pounds really quick and they think they're getting lean, but all they're doing is flushing out the water. So sometimes people say, yeah, the keto diet works so great but then they go off the diet and they gain 10 pounds real quick. It's not fat, it's water. So is that one reason why maybe um, bodybuilders might uh, limit their salt uh, to, to painful levels because they're trying to reduce water retention and therefore make the skin sort of sit tighter against the, the muscle? Is that what that's about? And that's exactly, I'm glad you brought that up. There is a one time that we would restrict sodium and that would be for photo shoots or for bodybuilding competitions or we're, you know, when we're trying to look our absolute leanest to dry out the body, to look that really hard, dense look. Like if I had to do a photo shoot in two or three days from now, I would lose five to 10 pounds of water so that all the muscles are being uh, more visibly seen because they're being covered by some water. So if you cut out salt, you're going to pee out more water. You're going to go le get leaner. And also people could use diuretics, things like that to rid themselves of even more water. Which we should point out is probably very hazardous unless you're doing it very intelligently. And even then there's some risks, right? Oh yeah. It's absolutely dangerous. Like, and you could see MMA, mix, mixed martial arts, uh, boxing, all these sports where you have to drop 20 pounds in a day to make those weight classes very dangerous. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, but you'll actually actually cut out water, not just salt, but like water. You know, a, a day or, or two before competition. Not a day or two, but usually about seven. I say about seventeen. So roughly, almost a day. We'll cut out water. You, you drink as much water as humanly possible. Say two, three gallons a day. So you're drinking so much water. The body's expecting this water. Then suddenly. You cut it out cold turkey and you just keep peeing. Your body's expecting more water to come in. So it's flushing out all those electrolytes and you pee extra amounts of water. You end up excessively dehydrated, which is not a healthy state. But when you're a bodybuilder and you're on that posing stage or in a magazine, those photos, these are not your healthiest conditioned athletes. These are your closest to your death that day you're on a show or the day you're doing a photo shoot. You're actually dehydrated, starving, feeling like garbage. And, but you look your best, but after that, you have to drink back that water and oftentimes gain back a lot of body fat because you're at an unhealthy, low body fat percentage. And so it's very difficult to be a bodybuilder because you're judged based on an unhealthy look that you shouldn't be at, but then you shouldn't be at that all the time. But so you're hearing one thing, you look great, but really you're sickly because you're only at 5% body fat. On the other end, you're better at 15% body fat, but then they're saying, well, you're overweight. You need to lose the weight again. How does it feel? What does it feel like to cut water prior to competition? Is it is that cutting water misery? is worse than being starving? So when you're when you're really dehydrated, you're constantly thirsty. Your mouth it sucks. You have no energy. You feel like you're cramping up. It hurts to walk. You ache. It's very very difficult to sleep. That's probably the worst part for me. I can maybe if I'm really dehydrated, I'd struggle to sleep thirty minutes straight at a time. So it's really bad. It's funny. I've I've heard them talk about it in separate interviews. Um, Sly Stallone and Dolph Lundgren both mentioned that when they were shooting Rocky IV, um, they they did water cuts prior to to filming to get that ultra ripped look. I mean, they're already very lean, very muscular dudes, but they both dehydrated prior to filming those scenes. And I I think that people don't know. <laughs> it's, you talk about like beauty standards of Hollywood or whatever being unrealistic, and it's like people know about the 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 uh, people know about reducing uh, calories. People know about training really hard. I don't think they know about cutting water. I mean, it, it, that's how miserable it gets to look that cartoonishly like an action figure. And we're thinking it's Stallone and Dolph Lundgren. I mean, these guys are like mountains of muscle, but it's normal looking guys that do this too. Think of the newest Batman. I forget the actor's name. Um, he was cutting his water two or three days before the shoot, starving, miserable to look the way he did in Batman. He looked yeah. like an average guy, you know, 15%, like a healthy body that doesn't certainly look like a guy that starved himself or used dehydration methods to look that way for his Batman role. But yet there he was doing it, you know, just for a regular Batman role. I suppose that's something that most of us normals actually do know from our own experience. At least we know the flip side of that, which is that like, if you eat a whole pizza, you know that like your face is just bigger the next day, right? What specifically is providing that puff in the tissue? It's not just water. Is it, is it, is it glycogen? Well, it's water, water combined with sodium. The glycogen is going to be in the muscle. Okay. And if it's extra, extra glycogen that can't, so if you overeat, what happens is your liver is going to fill up with glycogen. Then your muscles fill up with glycogen. Then there's no more room left. That's where the adipose tissue, you know, becomes deposited. You get the fat deposit under the skin, you know? So if you're overeating calories and your muscles are, are full, well, it have no choice, but to store it as body fat. Let's just, uh, let's finish up just talking about straight up food. So uh, what's one of your favorite, you know, lean protein meals that you think a, a normal person, not just a, a competitive athlete could really get a lot of benefit out of? I would say without question, my most famous recipe is anabolic French toast. Um, by far, like I have over a million views on that video and I've done a number, I've done a number of different recipes, some with like blueberries in it. I made various, var I made various variations of this made in the oven. Uh, peach, apple, bake, and, and, and just so many different variations. And really all it is, is you have your bread, egg whites, and if you could, if you want cinnamon and uh, some kind of fake sugar or sugar substitute rather than adding in regular sugar, and you just basically combine it together and cook it up and you can't go wrong. The more egg whites you get in there, the better. So I like it, let it soak, really sit in there. And even while it's on the pan, I'll add more egg whites to it to suck it in even more. That way you're getting the max amount of protein for the fewest amount of calories because you're getting most of the calories from the bread, but you're getting all the protein from the egg whites. And so as opposed to using the yellows or adding creams and sugars, which most people do when making French toast, this is a much lower in calorie, higher in protein version. 
So you think it's really worth it for, for, for normal people to, to separate eggs for nutritional purposes? I mean, there's still a lot of protein in the yolk, right? And some good fats too. Well, by a lot, okay. If, if we're saying what's a lot of protein, the egg white is all protein, okay? Mm -hmm. The yellow is where all the fat is. So if somebody was eating a, a, a white of a large egg, they're getting about four grams of protein, about six, 16 calories, four times four, 16 calories. If you eat a whole large egg, about 75 calories. So you do the math, you're getting about 60 extra calories from the yellow and only about three extra grams of protein. So as a percentage, um, the yolk is actually the most highly, like it's mostly fat. And so if you're eating more calories from the egg whites, you can eat a lot more of them. So for example, two eggs, whole eggs would have about the same calories as 10 egg whites. So by adding in more egg whites and less egg yolks, 10 egg whites, 40 grams of protein, two whole eggs, about 15 grams of protein, the same amount of calories. So you got 40 grams of protein here versus 15. And so that's why I'm adding in the egg whites as opposed to the yellows. Also, it's more voluminous, more voluminous, it's lower in calories. And so you're more full from it. And it's not that the egg whole egg is bad. There's some good healthy fats and nutrients in there. It's that if you overconsume calories, regardless if they're healthy or not, you're then going to be in a calorie surplus and you're going to gain body fat. So the trick is how do you balance it? And so to somebody that would say, well, I want some whole eggs, I would say, just split it up half and half. Use one whole egg and a couple egg whites. You're saving some calories, adding in more protein. It's funny. I mean, you're someone who you really beat the drum of calories in, calories out. It's as simple as that at the end of the day. And it's one of these things that I, I always think when you say it, I think, you know, that's true, Coach Greg. But it's there's lots of things we can say in life that are true, but aren't necessarily helpful <laughs> to say, right? Because like, because all calories are not equal, right? Like there's foods that are going to make you more likely to eat again in an hour and foods that are less likely to make you eat again in an hour. And they might have the same amount of calories, but the one that is going to keep you satisfied for longer is better, right? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think it's important to know this that. I think that, however, I think that, Telling people calories in, calories out at the end of the day will help you lose weight or, or cause you to lose weight. I think that's empowering people because some people think that, no, I can't lose weight. I've tried every diet. I can't lose the weight. Uh, it's my hormones, my underactive thyroid, my bad genetics. I have too much ghrelin. I'm too hungry. Not enough leptin. I'm never satiated. I come from a poor socioeconomic status. I don't have the money. I don't have the time, as Donald Trump said, on time to lose weight. And so they think they're helpless. But really, if they are in a deficit, they will lose weight. And to get into that deficit, that is up to you. No matter what, I mean, you might have, it might not have been your choice to become obese, but it's your choice to no longer be obese. You can choose not to be obese by eating in a deficit. Now, if there's certain foods for me, for example, ice cream, I can't have ice cream. I know I'm going to eat it all. Cereal, bad choices for me. The calories are the calories, but I need to make a logical, smart, proactive decision to choose other foods, not have those things in my sight, have them out of the house so that I can eat in a calorie deficit and be full and happy. And so absolutely, um, calories in, calories out will always work. But we can't forget that you have to set yourself up for success, which is why I made my cookbook, low calorie, delicious recipes, easy to make that anyone can do. And so if you haven't got the cookbook, then how can you say you've tried everything to lose weight? I was interested in asking you a question, though. You've been sure. trying to lose weight for a couple months now. Is that is that true? Yeah, I mean, I yo-yo all the time, and it sucks. Um, I sort of, I have, I've for many years, I've had a, a seasonal kind of weight gain and loss where I I put on pounds in winter, especially around holidays, and then I you know I get out in the summer and I'm much happier and much more active, and I lose it, and it's just this kind of constant cycle, and it's not good for me. And so yes, I'm trying. After my most recent holiday weight gain, I am I'm making an effort to try to lean up, but this time like do it very slowly and make it permanent. Like I know how to crash diet, I'm really good at it. It's bad. I'm I just turned forty. I I can't do this shit anymore. I just need to develop healthier habits and stick to them. Um, but you know my. I have occupational hazards, you know, given what I do for a living too. Yeah. And so let's go over this. Okay. So you're, yeah. you've been, you've been a habitual yo-yo dieter for a long time, which I think 95% of people that watch this are going to be on the same page with because 95% of diets fail. So there's a one in 20 chance that the diet you're on right now is going to work. So how can we increase those odds? And so what is it in the past that's caused you to get off the diet? Is it 
hunger, the taste, the, the boredom from the diet, not being able to exercise. What is the main issue? You know what, the, what it's actually, um, as I've gotten older, the number one problem with my diet is actually my night snacking. Um, my eating during the day is pretty good. Um, but I wake up, I wake up very hungry at night and will often just go down and grab a handful of M&Ms or something like that. Um, and then try to go back to sleep. And, uh, I, I'm not sure why that is. And when I, when I cut out night snacking, um, entirely, when I go cold Turkey, it's amazing. I mean, even if I'm eating a pretty decent diet, I, I still wake up in the night with like painful hunger pangs to the point where I can't get back to sleep again. Okay. Well, I, I have a couple of theories here. So possibly you're not eating enough calories earlier in the day. And then what happens is ghrelin re goes up. That's a hunger hormone. And so later in the night, you get that, that crazy hunger and you can't stop eating. Now, what I tell people is at night that 90% of people they're eating too much at night. What you need to do is have a low calorie dense voluminous filling meal so that you're actually full in the evening so that you can get through that night. I understand exactly what you're talking about. I have the same thing. It's easy to diet during the day. I don't have a cheat at noon and three o'clock. It's easy. Most people are the same way. What it is, is that the evening time. So you want to have those foods readily available. And I'm telling you the protein ice cream, for three or 400 calories, you will not be able to even finish it. And no, it's not going to taste as good as your own recipe. This is like the cream and all that yumminess. It's going to be 80% is good though. And so if you switch over to like that protein ice cream, you're going to be full. You're going to go to bed with a stomach like, oh, I ate too much, literally. And then you're going to have so few calories. You're going to be in that deficit. It's going to let you lose weight. So I think you should probably eat a little bit more earlier in the day. And in the later in the night, think of more voluminous meals. Earlier in the day, you can eat more like, I don't know if you eat nuts and stuff, but if you eat more of those calorie dense foods, you know, eat that, eat some of your own recipes. You're not going to over, overeat them and binge on them like the higher calorie things. But later in the day, structure it so that there's less calories and it's very voluminous, more fruits and vegetables things like that so that you're full during the day no big deal at night low calorie dense foods i think that'll help you 100 percent. greg Doucette, coach greg check him out on youtube check out his cookbook he's the best thanks coach thanks for having me great to be here greg Doucette, check out his ultimate anabolic cookbook maybe i'll try making his ice cream recipe on my channel maybe see if i can get it to taste 85 percent as good as real ice cream instead of 80 percent is good Hey, let's do a quick failure of the week. This week I failed when I got most of the way through researching a video about xanthan gum before I realized that not once had I considered any potential human health problems associated with xanthan gum. Xanthan gum is widely used in processed foods, and ever since Bob's Red Mill started selling it in grocery stores, I have been an enthusiastic user of xanthan gum in my kitchen and an enthusiastic advocate of other people using it in their home kitchens. I started working on a video all about how xanthan gum works on the molecular level and how you actually use it for thickening and stabilizing things, and I would have done that whole video without a single thought towards xanthan gum's health and safety had it not not been for a fan named Chris who emailed me a paper that just published in the latest edition of Nature Microbiology. This research is out of the University of Michigan, and there's a school in Norway involved too. Basically, they fed xanthan gum to mice whose systems they colonized with common human gut bacteria, and they watched to see how the xanthan gum got metabolized. The work of these scientists indicates that xanthan gum does get eaten by this one type of anaerobic bacteria that is common in the guts of industrialized peoples, and it gets broken down into oligosaccharides, which are basically slightly complex carbohydrates. It's not like thousands of sugar molecules stuck together like starches, and oligosaccharide is like five or six or seven starch molecules stuck together. In fact, I think it's literally anything between three and 10. It's still not directly digestible by humans. They tend to go into the large intestine where bacteria eat them, and then the bacteria produce various byproducts. And this is one of the reasons why beans, the musical fruit, make you toot, as the song goes. I don't know if that's a problem with xanthan gum, though. Earlier studies did show that uh, ingesting huge amounts of xanthan gum did have a, a laxative effect, 
But this new research indicates that one human gut microbe breaks the xanthan gum down into oligosaccharides, and then another kind of bacteria eats those oligosaccharides, and this could potentially affect human health. This research shows that xanthan gum is probably not biologically inert in people. It may affect our gut microbiome and feed populations of buggies in our guts that wouldn't normally be fed. And maybe that's why those buggies are there in the guts of industrialized peoples who eat processed foods and not in the guts of other kinds of people. And who knows if any of that matters. But generally, scientists are finding that everything about the gut microbiome matters in some way. And it matters that xanthan gum was non-existent in human food until the 1960s, and now it's in everything. So we should be keeping tabs on it and figuring out exactly what it's doing in people's bodies, good or bad. I'm not scared of it. I'm still eating xanthan gum. I'm still cooking with it. It's obviously not acutely toxic. It's good that there is ongoing research about it, and that's why I was happy to tell you about it. I don't think that I failed by writing a video about how great xanthan gum is. I failed by not even once considering any health dimension for that video until Chris emailed me that paper, so thank you, Chris. I'll still do the vid on xanthan gum. I just need a little more time to work on it. The curious case of the composer and the Coke syrup is next, but first. Episode 6 of the Adam Ragusea pod is sponsored by Helix Sleep. You know what blows up even faster than Coach Greg's muscles when he carbs up for a competition? I'll tell you what, it's a premium mattress in a box from Helix. I have two of them. They are both real, very high quality foam and spring mattresses, like the kind you would normally have to get delivered to your house by like moving guys in a truck. But the mattress from Helix literally just shipped to my house in a box under compression. You carry the box into the bedroom, you break the vacuum seal, and the mattress just goes poof and expands almost instantly. It's crazy. And it's a mattress that you can buy online instead of going to the store where it's a whole thing like buying a car with salesmen and all that. Just go to helixsleep.com slash ragusia and take their sleep quiz. Answer honestly about the positions you sleep in, how your body is shaped, and they will match you with a mattress made for you, not somebody else. They've got soft, medium, and firm mattresses. They got mattresses for cooling you down if you sleep hot at night. They got mattresses for spinal alignment. There's even a mattress for plus size people. Lauren and I have been sleeping on a Helix Dusk for like a year, and it's helped a lot with my back pain. It's the best. Helix was named the best overall mattress of 2021 by GQ and Wired. Go to helixsleep.com slash ragusia. That's in the show notes. My link will get you up to $200 off a mattress plus two free pillows. The mattress ships free. There's a 10-year warranty. And if you decide you don't like it within 100 nights, they'll come and take it back. No risk. There's financing and payment plans available too. helixsleep.com slash ragusia. Thank you, Helix. Coke syrup. Did your parents ever give you Coke syrup as a medicine? That used to be a big thing. I'm talking about the, uh, the concentrated syrup of Coca-Cola or any cola type beverage. It used to be sold widely as an over-the-counter medicine for upset stomach, particularly for children. And it still is to some extent, despite there being virtually no research to support its efficacy as far as I can see. There is research indicating that phosphoric acid can have an anti-emetic effect, anti-nausea effect. Coke has phosphoric acid and it has sugar. There's lots of people who think that a combination of glucose, fructose, and phosphoric acid or citric acid could be good for an upset stomach. Though again, I can't find any real studies directly testing whether something like Coke syrup actually helps kids with the throw-ups. I suppose people continue to use it for that purpose because it probably won't hurt anybody. And at the very least, kids like treats. And when your kid is sick, you want to give them something they like. So you give the poor kid some Coke syrup to suck on while they you know, watch a movie on the couch. You get a bad taste in your mouth when you throw up. So it's nice to have something sweet and yet not voluminous in case you're going to throw up again. I threw up one day in kindergarten at the uh, little Quaker school in State College, Pennsylvania that I went to, I remember standing in a line in a room with brown carpet. And then I remember doubling over on that carpet. And I remember my dad picking me up. I went home. I sat on the couch. I nursed my Coke syrup. And I watched Star Trek IV, The One with the Whales. It's actually called Star Trek IV, The Journey Home, but 
We're going to call it Star Trek IV, the one with the whales. It's the one where Captain Kirk has to go back in time and save some humpback whales. It sounds stupid, but it's actually a brilliant premise and an absolutely delightful little film. I love all the original cast Star Trek films, even number five. But the one with the whales has a special place in my heart. Maybe because I associate it with that day in 1987 or 88 when I got to come home from school early because I threw up and watch Star Trek IV. And my mom gave me Coke syrup. I was thinking about all of this and about Star Trek IV, the one with the whales, recently because my friends Ben and Adam are out on a live podcast tour where they are recapping Star Trek IV, the one with the whales. Ben and Adam make a Star Trek podcast called The Greatest Generation, and they are currently on tour with a live act. I saw them down in Atlanta the other day, got totally bombed. It's good times. And as I was driving down there to Atlanta to see the show, I listened to the epic orchestral score for Star Trek IV. And as much as I love that music, that score does harbor a dark secret. It's a secret that I and only like three other people on the internet seem to have noticed, as far as I can tell. The orchestral score for Star Trek IV, the one with the whales, was stolen. And even if you don't care about Star Trek or music or plagiarism, I think you're going to like this story. As best as I've been able to piece it together, this is a bonkers story. Allow me to relate to you the tale of Leonard Rosenman, composer of the original music for Star Trek IV, The One with the Whales. Leonard Rosenman was born in 1924, and in his early 20s, he was the hottest young composer in New York. Hot in the sense that people liked his music, and orchestras and chamber ensembles were performing it left and right, he was also hot in the sense that he was very hot. He was a very charismatic and handsome young man. He looked like he should be starring in the movies, not scoring them. But Leonard Rosenman was not scoring movies at all yet in the early 1950s. He was a serious composer. He was one of the last pupils of Arnold Schoenberg, the godfather of intellectually difficult 20th century classical music that almost no one actually wants to listen to. Rosenman was one of those guys. But he was also disgustingly handsome and a popular fellow with the ladies. And one night in New York, he's at a party. He's playing piano and breaking hearts at a party in New York. He was being that guy at the party who plays piano. I suspect that guy at the party who plays piano was not quite as obnoxious back in the early 1950s, back when recorded music was not as ubiquitous and high quality as it is today. So maybe people at parties back then actually appreciated it when a guy played piano, as long as he played it well, especially if that guy was Leonard Rosenman. At this party, another disgustingly handsome young man noticed Leonard Rosenman's playing. Later, this other handsome young man shows up at Rosenman's New York apartment and knocks on the door. He says, Leonard, you play amazing. You got to give me piano lessons. I'm totally making up this dialogue, by the way. I have no idea what specifically transpired in this conversation, but the conversation is said to have happened. Something like this. This other handsome young man did, in fact, in real life, show up at Rosenman's door requesting piano lessons. And I imagine he would have said something like, hey, I'm an actor. And if I could play the piano like you, boy, that would really help me land some roles. And this is where I imagine Leonard Rosenman saying, okay, buddy, I'll give you piano lessons. What's your name? My name's Jimmy. And that is the story of how composer Leonard Rosenman met James freaking Dean right before James Dean became the hottest actor in Hollywood. They became best friends. They moved in together, roommates and BFFs in New York on the cusp of their careers. Somebody with a camera had the foresight to follow Leonard Rosenman and James Dean around one day in the early 50s, and you can Google image search the photos, and you should do it right now if you want to see two incredibly handsome, talented young men in beautifully tailored suits cavorting around New York or Hollywood or wherever it was, just kicking ass and breaking hearts. There's this one picture of them sleeping together, like collapsed in a heap in their evening finery after a night on the town. It's pretty hot stuff for people who are into such things. Anyway, Leonard Rosenman was roommates and BFFs with James Dean. And that's how Leonard Rosenman ended up composing the score for East of Eden and Rebel Without a Cause. 
And just like that, Leonard Rosenman was the hottest young composer in Hollywood. But this is where his story takes some darker turns. As soon as Rosenman's career in Hollywood exploded, it collapsed in New York. He is said to have been really bothered by this. The serious classical music world did not regard film composers very well back then. He was immediately regarded as a sellout, and no ensemble in New York would touch his music. Later in his life, he had to watch as a whole new generation of composers like Philip Glass. They were able to move with ease between the concert music and the movie music worlds, but he was not. Of course, his BFF, James Dean, died tragically in 1955. Rosenman won an Academy Award in the 70s, but it was for an adapted score, not an original score. It was for Barry Lyndon, the Stanley Kubrick movie, Barry Lyndon. Kubrick famously was not a fan of using original music in his movies. He really preferred to use existing classical compositions, and the score that he commissioned from Rosenman was basically just arrangements of Bach and Haydn tunes. And the following year, Leonard Rosenman won another Oscar, this time for the Woody Guthrie biopic, Bound for Glory, which naturally consisted of arrangements of Woody Guthrie tunes. And Rosenman gave this kind of rueful acceptance speech at the Oscars. He said, this is getting ridiculous. I write original music too, you know. And I'm sure he was joking. And I'm sure he was also kind of not joking. Rosenman did the score for the 1978 animated Lord of the Rings movie by Ralph Bakshi, which you should totally see if you have never seen. It is completely insane. It is right up there with like David Lynch's Dune in the ranks of beautiful catastrophes. It is such a failure of a movie and yet so much fun to watch. It covers the events of the first two Tolkien books and then it just stops and there was never a sequel to cover Return of the King. It consists of this totally incoherent mishmash of animation styles, mostly for cost-saving purposes. Some of it is, you know, expensive Disney-style cell animation, but most of it is other stuff like rotoscoping, where they shoot live action footage, and then they just have low-paid animators trace each frame of the film. A lot of the movie is also just live actors performing behind a screen, kind of like shadow puppets, because that sort of looks like a cartoon, I guess. It is just a mess. And they, they also, they decided that the names of the bad guys in Lord of the Rings sounded a little too much alike for audiences to understand and keep them apart. Like Sauron and Sauron sounded too much alike. So they decided to rename the character Aroman, which is a totally defensible creative decision, but they apparently made it like halfway through the production so in some of the movie, they call him Saruman, and in some of the movie, they call him Aroman. None of this reflects negatively on Leonard Rosenman, who did a very fine job writing the score. There is a particularly memorable cue in the climax of the film, which is the Battle of the Hornburg, you know, end of two towers, right? And Gandalf rides in with the cavalry at the last second, he saves the day, and Rosenman wrote this beautiful sequence that builds to these kind of celebratory church bells is how I hear them. I'll play a teeny little bit of that score here from Lord of the Rings 1978 animated movie. So yeah, it's a really nice score. Anyway, I have not been able to find much more biographical information about Leonard Rosenman. It does seem that his career waned toward the end. He may have had some personal problems. I can see that he was twice divorced and widowed once. He himself died with some kind of dementia condition, and you know, who knows when the first symptoms of that might have manifested. It may sound like a terrible indignity for a great composer to have to score Star Trek IV, The One with the Whales. But you got to remember that in the mid-1980s, the Star Trek movie franchise was really on fire. And this is long before the days when there were a million franchises that were on fire. It's basically Star Trek and Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Star, well, Indiana Jones and Back to the Future. Those are your franchises. Also Rambo. I think I'm defeating my point here. And Rocky. 
Star Trek franchise was on fire. Star Trek IV was a decently budgeted film that ended up being a big hit and made a ton of money. The score Rosenman turned in for Star Trek IV, the one with the whales, was awesome, delightful, sophisticated but fun, classic Rosenman. Here's a clip. Yep, that is the same damn cue from the Lord of the Rings cartoon. Now, before you say, hey, Adam, it's not plagiarism when an artist plagiarizes from themselves. Well, consider the fact that artists for hire generally do not own their work product. When Paramount Pictures pays you to write a film score, they own that music, not you, unless other very unusual arrangements have been made. I have no idea what the legal situation was with Leonard Rosenman in those two particular films. I know how it usually is. It would generally be bad form to simply Xerox sections of a score that you wrote for one production company and then go and sell them to another. Like I said, as far as I can tell, I am one of like three guys on the internet who seems to have noticed this dark secret of the score for Star Trek IV, the one with the whales. If you have inside info on the situation, I would love to hear about it. A. Ragusea at Gmail. But absolutely none of this diminishes my love for the work of Leonard Rosenman. He is one of the great classic American film composers. Someone needs to make a buddy pick about Leonard Rosenman and James Dean palling around New York in like the six months or whatever before they both got very famous. Again, Google image search those two guys and tell me you do not want to see a movie about those two guys palling around New York, kicking ass, breaking hearts right before they blew up. And certainly none of this diminishes my eternal love for Star Trek IV, the one with the whales, which started on my parents' couch with a little cup of Coke syrup on ice that my mom gave me because I threw up on a brown carpet at kindergarten. I wonder if you have a food and a movie that are forever linked in your mind because of some kind of childhood experience. I bet you do. Anyway, thanks for listening to the pod. I'll see you on YouTube on Monday with part two of this little series I'm doing about uh, commercial pasta manufacturing. We're going to talk about why pasta is made with semolina flour. There are some surprisingly good reasons for that. And the pod will be back next Saturday, perhaps with another guest who will make people say, whoa, didn't see that collab coming. Talk to you then.